Welcome, golf fans, pursuers of knowledge in the almighty dollar. This is your golf guru bringing you the 2023 Zurich Classic. This is going to be my preview show. We're going to go through all the course information and all that fun stuff. The tournament, the format, we're going to get into my betting side, give you some ideas there. We're also going to jump over and talk about all the DFS stuff. I'm even going to put a lineup together for you. Just the talk, there's a little bit of nuances for this team event that's a little different. But first and foremost, thank you for stopping by, checking me out. And with all that said, let's go talk a little golf. All right, so real quick, let's recap the RBC, another de uh, elevated event that, that had a lot of, you know, some interest there towards the end, which was key. Of course, I just had these three up because these were kind of the three main cast characters that we had going to the final holes. Of course, you had Fitzy, Cantlay, and Jordan, and all this is showing in their past. If you're interested, how many times they've been in the final pairings, what's their scoring average been, how many wins did they get in there, and their best score. And, of course, Jordan dominated that mostly back in 2015. And I think everybody uh, which was talking about the golf world was on uh, hole 14 here, the par 3, which seems like this hole every year is towards the end is what makes or breaks who's going to win this thing. If you remember the previous year, you had uh, Shane Lowry, who you know a lot of the guys will try to keep the ball left. And he hit it a little too far left and then had that crazy chip, which we got to watch with this, that ran out of the water, that kind of, you know, did lose him the tournament, really set him back. And the same with, which was interesting, right? You had Spieth and Cantlay that were off to the left. You had, if I remember right, Fitzy was actually on the green. or He had a lot more manageable shot or putt uh, coming up than these guys had. But what was interesting is, you know, Spieth did it. Of course, he was freaking out, but, you know, the collar kept, kept it on the green. And then, of course, Cantley went after and saw how fast it was, and he still ended up where you see the ball there rolling into the ball cat in this very precarious position. And the reason why I have this, as we all know, is I think I timed it from the time that the ball – well, I, I stood that back. From the time that he walked up and started to look at where his ball was resting and decide what he was going to do to the time he actually hit the shot – with a commercial in there, I believe it was like over 10 minutes of time, which did not help the whole story of Patrick Cantlay and his very slow play. Long story short, as you know, he hit a good shot and ended up making bogey. But um, that was kind of the change where, you know, it kind of allowed uh, Fitzy to get back. And, of course, Spieth also made a bogey there. And then, at the, you know, of course, at the very end, you know, Cantlay kind of at the time, it was Spieth and Cantlay. Cantlay kind of got removed uh, a little bit. And then it came down, of course, Fitzy and Spieth to go into playoff and which i tweeted out which was very interesting was the previous year i kind of felt like you know jordan yes he moved up on sunday a bit but all the other guys kind of melted away and really spieth i felt like didn't really win the tournament i felt like the other guys lost the tournament but these guys made it to a playoff and of course the first playoff hole spieth had a putt that should have went in and i will look at stroke gain data because it's a little different than of course where spieth ended up last year but honestly, I felt like Speed should have won his tournament. Then he went to 17. Uh, so that happened on 18. You know, they both par it. And then on 17, you know, they they both had putts to, again to win. And, and Speed looked like he had it and, and missed it again. And then they go back to 18. And, of course, uh, our buddy there, Fitzy, hits an amazing iron shot within, I don't know, a foot of the hole. And uh, Speed went a little long. He was kind of, it seemed like, in between clubs. I think he was between a pitching wedge. The wind was blowing and a nine iron. And, uh, of course, he couldn't make, I think it was like a 30-footer. Uh, Fitzy becomes your winner. And if you know quite a bit or uh, are watching the coverage, you know, uh, Fitzy, they showed, you know, was coming here as a kid. This was one of his top tournaments to ever win outside of a major. It was his top tournament to win. And it was kind of odd because his results, we, in the golf world, all saw that this should make total sense. He loved the course. He wanted to win so bad here. Sometimes that could be uh, a detriment. He has kind of a mixed bag of results. He had a couple miss cuts. He had a couple, you know, top 30s, 20s. Uh, and then also a couple of good results. But, uh, you know, I think a lot of us, uh, at least me personally, wasn't really on Fitzy because I was still trying to figure out where he was with the neck. Uh, I watched him play a lot of bad golf this year, and that was due to a lot what he was dealing with the deck. And I, I go back to, like, Pebble Beach, the AT&T Pro-Am, where, like, the guy, it felt like he didn't even know where the ball was going to where he's at now. And I, I did mention in the show, felt like what I saw at the Masters at Augusta that the neck was not bothering him anymore. He played very well there. So it wasn't a super concern, but I think with some past history, how bad he wanted to win here and still not totally sure uh, where he was out with the swing. That was a little bit. Of, and then also, you know, I didn't, in the showdown for Sunday, I didn't play a lot of Fitzy because 
typically when you see the round that he had on Saturday, which I believe he shot, what, 64, something like that, seven under, I got to watch quite a bit of that. And that guy I've never seen, he had, he had a lot of like Jordan Spee shots where, you know, he was in the Kohina shells and he was like 150 out. It literally hits a branch out of the Kohina, bounces in the hole. He chipped in once for, you know, so he had one of those rounds uh, he had another shot approach that hit another tree limb, which shot it towards the hole, ended up like three feet where, you know, wouldn't have been on the green. So there was a bit of that speed luck magic that happened on Saturday, which I kind of felt like, you know, that's not going to happen again. And, and that ultimately, typically, you just can't see those back-to-back rounds. But good for Fitzy, great win. And then if you're curious from a stroke game perspective, you know, Jordan, again, you can see he did everything he needed to do to win, gaining, you know, five strokes with a putter, Uh, which last year he lost, I believe, two and a half strokes to the field with the putter. Uh, But gain, you know, led uh, on approach, gain off the tee. You can see Fitzy, you know, very similar, just a little less. He's a Cantlay, gained five strokes, did everything well, a little less around the green. Also, yeah, Ches Review was one of my picks, uh, which worked out really well. A lot that was on, right, that 175 to 200, Ches Review was actually leading the field, believe that or not. Also, he showed up at, what, the Valspar, I believe it was, Valero Valspar, I think it was Valspar, where he had like a six, you know, before they had a ton of missed cuts, but ended up with a six. And so that was a, a, a nice, but it just didn't do enough for me. Uh, Emiliano Grillo was one of my picks. So I went with a lot of ball strikers that weren't the greatest putter, of course, which you don't see on here. We had Jimmy Walker, the Texan, who, uh, you know, was dealing with like Lyme disease, was a PGA champion before that. Had quite a few wins back like in the, the I believe the 2013 to 2015 era. It was kind of a shocker that he was up there leading going into uh, Saturday. And of course, you know, a lot of us kind of felt like he would fall back, which he did. I think he ended up nine under or something like that. But long story short, good tournament, Brian Harmon. That was kind of interesting from a perspective. You see he gained across the board very nicely. Brian Harmon had an amazing fall season and kind of kicking off, um, you know, into that and then kind of fell apart start of the 2023. And this, for me uh, personally, that I can think of was one of the better finishes he's had recently. Uh, Mark Harbert showed up, uh, which was a little unique. So anyways, uh, overall, good tournament. Of course, you can see Cantlay and Shoffley here, 1,600, 1,500. Of course, that is a pretty good segue that we can uh, talk about uh, going into the Zurich. All right, the last thing I'm going to talk about real quick is the whole Rory McIlroy kind of uh, discussion, right? And kind of, you know, I'm very interested to see what comes out of this. I'm, I'm shocked that Rory has not addressed the media at all. Uh, on this topic but you know here was Xander talking about you know he pulled out of the RBC with no reasoning uh he already pulled out of the tournament of champions which you know now he's got two pulls out of the designated events and which means it's going to cost him some money but what's crazy of course this was Rory's kind of agenda to have these designated events increase the purses uh get all the best players he's been the face of the PGA now for quite a bit with the whole live tour thing uh, so I thought it was interesting, Rory here, just kind of stating that, you know, hey, these are the rules. The rules is what he was kind of uh, pushing for. And, uh, you know, the irony was that, you know, he ended up not showing and that. And, of course, it doesn't help that he came uh, after a miscut after the Masters. So I'm curious if something's going on in the personal life that we just don't know about that affected his play at the Masters, that he didn't, you know, as far as I know, he had no pressers after his miscut at the Masters. Then he pulls out of the RBC. And then, of course, you know, even Damon kind of weighed in here that, again, he was leading the charge, as I just stated, about, you know, wanting all these things. And then he's the one that's kind of breaking the rules. And then the last thing, you know, also, as you guys have probably heard, he's going to lose out on $3 million because he's going to get docked on his PIP money. So I'm going to be very interested when I think Rory's next showing is at the Wells Fargo, if he plays in that. But uh, I hope he comes out. It's not a good look. Uh, for everything that's going on and and just whatever it is just state what's going on or you know and if it's purely hey I'm just bitter that I missed the cut to get my uh, you know grand slam of the four majors and needed some time for mental health you know Lisa come out and say that I need a mental health break Uh, give us something and it was the last thing I'll touch on if you got to watch kind of Rom when he stepped in uh, on Sunday later in the tournament actually when that bulkhead shot from Patrick Cantley was going on to do some, we'll call it color commentary. It seemed like the media was, they didn't come out and say it, but they were like, look at, you know, also John Rahm, you came to this tournament, you just won the Masters and you're here. If anybody was going to withdraw, you think it'd have been, you know, John Rahm, who actually I think had the ability to withdraw without being, you know, docked any money. And, you know, that he comes out and says, hey, I'm here because I said I'd be here. 
And, you know, no matter my game wasn't going to be perfect, you know, there's a lot of kids that are coming to watch me, I'm a man of my words, all that kind of thing. It was like almost kind of rubbing it a little bit in Rory Smith. I'm not saying that's what he was trying to do, but it felt like the media just kept kind of pushing that without really stating it. So I don't know. I don't know if, you know, you guys give me your opinion on that if you felt that way, but to have John kind of taking the lead, if you want to say, to be the face of the PGA during the RBC and, and without Rory being there and not talking, it was just, it left me with a little bit of a bad taste. I'm a huge Rory fan. I love what he's been doing, but it wasn't good. It wasn't good because of course, Liv got a lot of kind of hype out of the masters. I mean, look what we did. Rory misses the cut. Then he, you know, you know, misses or showed that does, you know, withdraws early from the RBC. No reasoning why. Let's go talk about the Zurich. And we are talking about the Zurich Classic. This used to be a single man event uh, back before 2017. It moved to this team event uh, after that. And it's kind of odd. I mean, this is, I'm, I am one that likes some changes in the format, but I guess where I'm a little bitter because of how much I like the match play and how much I'm not the hugest fan of this. Uh, but there is a positive to this. And the positive is, I think from a betting side, there is an opportunity. And you guys, I know it might sound like a broken record at times, but possibility uh, for a long shot. And we'll we'll talk about that as we go through the teams and the history of this event. Um, of course, it's another Pete Dye course, but I don't really feel like it's a typical Pete Dye that really challenges. I'm not saying it's an easy course, but I'm not saying it's TBC Sawgrass. It is not what we just saw at Harbor Town. Uh, of course, they had a $2 million renovation back in 2019. It is a par 72, pretty standard. Uh, we'll go through the scorecard, but it has four par fives uh, spread out, two on each nine. It is 7,425 yards, so distance, you know, can come to play, ball striking. But we've seen a lot of different things here, and that's what we're going to get into. Of course, it's Bermuda across the board. Rough, last I seen, was two inches. And then we're back to, like, this Tiff Eagle Bermuda, which we saw quite a bit in the Florida swing with that overseed of POA. Even though it's been warmer, what I've understood is that the POA really is not dominant at all because the Bermuda has actually taken and grown. So um, we saw a bit of that RBC in that conversation. Okay, so the player field is 80 teams and the top 35 teams in ties will make the cut. So 160 guys teaming up typically. We're going to go through some of this, but you've got a lot of teams that have played together uh, in this event or maybe the QB shootout. Uh, maybe they played together a while ago and they're back together. And then you also got guys that just, you know, they know this is an opportunity at least to get some FedEx points, uh, possibly like, you know, I'm not saying Xander, but if you remember Xander was kind of struggling for a win. And then, of course, uh, him and Cantley joined up and he got that win uh, last year. But you've got some guys that are just put together with guys. So we'll kind of go through that. Who's been together? Because team chemistry, I think, is relevant. Uh, typically, guys that win here. Uh, play together have good team chemistry of course you got to have a golf game too but uh all that together typically works out pretty well historical cut line is pretty high right i mean uh, we're going to talk about the format of how it goes five to seven under is typically what you need to get through to the weekend and winning scores over the last few years been somewhere between 22 to 27 under the green size here are pretty pretty standard i always say 5500 square feet is the average on the pga tour so just a hair less you got a ton of sand out here 106 uh, sand bunkers You've actually got five water hazards with eight holes where water actually comes into play. And the step meter coming from the uh, superintendent says right now it is at 12, which I don't know, I'd say fast to average. You know, I always say 13 is when I think it's, you know, super fast or, you know, some of the fastest greens they play. So pretty quick on the greens. And then, of course, we'll see how the weather affects that. Course defense, uh, you are off the Gulf of Mexico, so we can have the wind. We got, uh, you know, the water, as I talked about, eight holes. You've got some tree lines. you got a lot of sand. Um, you know, this course actually in 2021 got hit by, I believe it was Ida, the hurricane, and they lost quite a bit of trees. Uh, but they have recently been, you know, replanting to get back some of that, you know, coverage. Uh, so the course was a little simpler, at least uh, when we saw it in 2022. Some things I note here is many tee shots require a draw. That's kind of interesting. Team chemistry, as I mentioned, you got guys like Burns and Billy Horschel who now played this, what, this will be our third time together. Where they take it, you know, Billy Ho, he takes this very serious. They literally, he maps out a whole plan and these guys will sit down and figure out, okay, when they do alternate shot, who's going to take which, you know, the par threes, Billy Ho does better, but Sam Burns is better off the tee in length. Literally, they'll sit there and figure out how they're going to go at this. So that's why the team stuff, uh, and of course, having a good time and really enjoy playing together um, typically works out. We've seen kind of the ball striking teams do well. We've seen the guys that are like masters at putting around the green. Uh, kind of the plotters and strategic. So 
it's all a mix and that's why I, we are going to go through the past standings and kind of talk a little about that i said like a, more playable than other pete die courses but you still need to gain plan and navigate and then if you want to understand the format i'll get a little more into this got a, like best ball where both guys play their own ball they take the lowest score at each hole that's where they typically go very low average scores around 65 and then on uh friday sunday uh you also play alternate shots so thursday They'll probably open up with best ball, if I remember correct, and then go to alternate shot. And then if you make the weekend, again, best ball, alternate shot, a little bit more on the format. So again, uh, starting 2017, when they went to this team, they do, like I said, a four ball. When I say that, it is because four guys are actually playing their own ball. And then foursomes means just, I don't know why, but I I like a lot better when they call it alternate shot. And you can see where they're going to score low is going to be on the four ball. And you can kind of see over the past history Typically, as I mentioned, around 65 is what they shoot. And then it's really the guys who can hold together an alternate shot is what I noticed. So, you know, there's a whole thing on alternate shot, right? Who plays the same kind of ball? Does that come into effect? On four ball, it's not as much. A guy plays their own ball, not to worry about it. An alternate shot, right? You know, if you got a guy that could just bomb it off the team, you got a guy that's really good around the green or putting, you try to kind of figure that out, you know, on how it will play if the hole plays the way you think. So there's a little bit of that strategy that goes into this. And then, of course, some past winners. Now, this is a little bit older, um, you, but you can see here guys that have won this event uh, alone. Brian Stewart, uh, Justin Rose, some you'll know, Billy Ho, um, you know, just give you some names. And then when it turned to uh, team, the first actual winners, funny enough, was Cam Smith and Jonas Blix. And that was Cameron Smith's first win on the PGA Tour. You got Billy Ho, who won with Scott Piercy. He's bounced around. Then you got the Ryan Palmer, which is kind of the laugh of this event, who's just kind of always somehow – Ended up with like one of the best players, Ryan Palmer, played with Jordan Spieth a couple times. He played with Rom to get the win. He played with Scotty Scheffler. I believe that was last year. And then, you know, like I said, he's just this year. Funny enough, he's actually with Scott Piercy, I noticed. So he did not get that number one uh, high guy. I, I don't know. He didn't uh, negotiate very well this time. And then real quick, this is a very piss poor map of the course. But really, all I'm going to call out here is you can see where the water kind of comes into play. On quite a few of these holes i think on nine here you can see it looks like on 17 16 it comes in if you go on the left um you got the trees and these long sand bunkers so there's a bit that you get in trouble to and again i mentioned it is the lowlands which you know if the water is out there and it looks like we'll talk about weather there the course could get a little soft and maybe it's already soft i didn't really sit there and analyze what they've been getting but if i had to guess in the springtime in new orleans they are probably a little wet and so distance can come into play but again a team format uh we're gonna we're gonna look at some stroke gain Dave. but really i kind of feel like you can throw it out the window um but we're gonna look at it anyway so you can see the guys at least from a recent form perspective and the other things but i think it's more about just talking through the teams and and which way you're kind of leaning on how you want to build or bet and then give you some more visualizations of the holes i mean again you can see water covering all this that's one thing I did kind of forget is you got a lot of this kind of pot bunkering and also uh, kind of, you know, bumps and hills and different lies that you can get in. So a little unique there. Again, you can see water uh, protecting here uh, on, uh, I have no clue what hole that is, but again, just to give you some kind of visuals if you've never seen this. And then the only thing I noted, and I don't remember, but I would have to guess they're going to shoot them off both tees. And if that's the, the case and you are playing showdown, I do like the guys going off the back because you get this par five. Uh, and then you get a par five on the second and then number, you know, this number, uh, the whole number one is, you know, ranked 12. So very, uh, the ability to get that pretty consecutive streak bonus is where I was going with all that. If you kind of want to look at the cards, like I said, I don't think there's anything crazy, but I mentioned the two par fives, very gettable. You got some long par threes on this course. So that would also be a part of the defense. Hence Billy Horschel, who actually won here in the past on this track. I always said he's one of the better long par three guys, Adam Scott. Any really good ball striker typically you like from the par threes. Just looking at the par fives, the yeah, longest one is 18, but also very gettable. So like I said, nothing uh, to kind of call out. I mean, for me is from a showdown perspective, is there an advantage to taking guys off 10 if they're getting shot off both tees? Because that's about the only thing to get the consecutive birdie bonus. Of course, uh, one of my favorite pairings back in the day was Leishman, who won, what was that, 2021? Oh, with Cam Smith. I think they went to a playoff with Louis. I think that was Schwartz. It was actually the first time Louis Ustason played in this event um they of course rocked the mullets and what i'm you know looking at from a stroke and analysis again just to call out what guys have been doing well um uh, but again i do i do not weigh this um the, the stroke game stuff nearly as much when we're trying to 
identify the guys that might fit a course better than others. Uh, but off the tee, approach, ball striking, very you know similar. Uh, a little more weighting around the screen, putting and short game, I think is a key thing. Uh, hence, these two guys, what they do very well. And then uh, you got these two proxies of the pins. Now, this shows up from the Zurich before it became a team event. Like, literally, we have no stroke game data uh, as it's been a team event because, you know, guys are, you know, rotating shots, that kind of thing. At the time, this 175 to 200 uh, was at 30%. Actually, it was 200 plus. But I think guys hit it further now back than 2016. So I kind of dialed it down a little bit. Also, this calls out this yardage from an approach. The best ball strikers are identified by that yardage. Then you got Prox to the pin, 100 to 125. Again, you know, I think that it comes out of the short game. It was the other thing that was kind of highlighted. And I, I kind of agree, not short game, but the, the short approach, uh, if you need to, on the par fives, who does that very well. And then literally looking at guys that have the most pretty or better opportunities. It's kind of the things that I'm going to call out from the stroke and that we're going to look at from a custom stat model. What uh, also the reason why I didn't get this show out till Tuesday was it took a long time. I don't know if you guys were looking at from a betting perspective for uh, A, for the betting market to get numbers out there because they're, they're terrified. I think they know when I say they're terrified, they took a long time to figure this out because this is the one tournament that I think the books could get hurt on. You know, yeah, you've got the top four or five teams, but we've seen these teams not do well here. I mean, Morikawa comes to mind. We'll look through past history, but, you know, he played with Matthew Wolf. They missed the cut. He played with uh, Victor Hovland, and they made the cut, but didn't do anything great. I think they ended up like 20th or something like that. Um, and then, of course, this year he's with Homa. Of course, the uh, Cal Bears, the California kids, I'll uh, be playing here. And I'm, I'm honestly not expecting a lot of those guys. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But, I mean, they're, both their games have not wowed me lately. And then, of course, you know, I've more and more, I'm just coming to the belief that Max Homa can really only do what he does when it comes to putting on POA. And it's been showing up over and over and over. So I've always had that lean. But, man, his game got so good from a ball striking perspective. And he is a very good putter on POA. But I don't feel like it translates when he gets on Bermuda. I think he's still trying to figure that out. So anyways, a little side note there. Okay, let's talk about the guys at recent form. So again, I mentioned off the tee. So what I'm really looking at is just overall good ball strikers. So you got 15% off the tee. That is taking distance and hitting fairways into effect. You got approach at 20. You got ball striking, which is combining these two things at 10. And then I waited pretty heavily around the green at 15, putting at 15. That birdie or better is at 5%. Um, not huge. We're going to go and we'll jump into uh, that kind of dashboard analysis to allow you guys to look at some further information on all these players so you can kind of make your decisions. Then there's those two proximities weighted at 5% each and then short game. So really 45% is all about short game because I really do feel like there's two ways you can get it done here. You can get it done as a team from a ball striking perspective and you can also get it done around the greens because we've seen these teams that have been, like I said, plotters that showed up uh, over and over in this kind of event. So we'll get to that. With all that said, if you're curious who the top 15 guys are that fit across that model, again, looking at recent form, past six tournaments, this is including RBC Heritage uh, data, but of course the Masters wouldn't be in here and Adele match play. But all the rest, uh, without no filters, number one, uh, Xander, Homa, Sanjay M, Cantlay, Wyndham Clark, Nick Taylor, Taylor Moore, Diddy McCarthy, Morikawa, Benny Martin, Cameron Percy, which is kind of interesting, the Australian. Sahith Thagala, Sammy Burns, Steve Stricker. You've got the uh, Ryder Cup captains playing together with uh, Zach Johnson and then Dylan Wu. And uh, so it makes kind of sense. I mean, Benny Martin's been playing amazing. It's kind of crazy how well he's been playing. Uh, of course, you had Nick Taylor had a chance to win at Waste Management. You had Cantlay, who's been you know playing a lot better once he finally got his clubs figured out. Sun GM just always steady. Max Holmba had a couple wins early on in the year. And then uh, Xander just been steady golf and had a really nice showing. Uh, really helped me out on a showdown perspective on Sunday, uh, making that charge same with Sun JM with two of the guys that I was on because they were ball striking the hell out of it. They just weren't putting that well. And then they finally started making little putts on Sunday. All right. Now uh, I want to just look at ball strikers again. And so where I'm going with this, if you're trying to put teams together that, you know, maybe have some similarities. And I was looking, you know, trying to match up. So of course, Morikawa, and uh, Cantley, where did he just go? Where's the 10 9? I swear. There it is. Oh, Homa. I'm sorry. Morikawa and Homa. So you can look by price if you want to see the two guys that are playing together that do some things very well. So you got, you know, Morikawa, Homa uh, at seventh ball striking over the last six tournaments, 24 rounds. 
You've got, uh, of course, Cantley and Xander up there at the top. Uh, Luke List, I forgot who he's with, but I said before, I feel like they're both good. I feel like they're both good off the tee, but they're terrible around the green. I just can't figure out the other guy's name off the top of my head. I'm trying to see if anybody else pairs up well. But that's one way you can look at this. Again, because alternate shot, you do, I feel like you do want guys that have similar games. Hence, Cam Smith and Mark Leishman uh, have very similar games. Always did. Both Australians, you know, both could get a little wayward off the tee. Both were really good irons, but exceptional around the green and putters. So, again, you could kind of look at what kind of teams you want to put together. Uh, I always feel like you really need the around the green and the putting. The ball striking stuff, yes, it's good. But I would almost weigh uh, when you get around the green and putting in this kind of event a little higher. Hence, with that said, if you want to know guys that have the best short game, uh, we can take a look and we can see if there's anybody that pairs up because I did not go through all this. And I didn't see anyone on the teams uh, that, you know, except on the ball striking stuff. But, of course, uh, Sammy Ryder, funny enough, again, you can look over here, is the top 15 guys in short game, if you don't understand, is around the green, the putting combined. Benny Griffin shows up to her Montgomery, which I think is interesting with Kitayama. We're going to talk about the betting side. Uh, Sammy Burns, Chad Ramey, who uh, showed up at the players, of course, won at, what, Puerto Rico or Corrales? I think it was Corrales. Uh, Max Homas, the hit. Nick Taylor, Fitzy, who's playing with his brother, which I think kind of knocks him down quite a bit. Uh, hence, even the price tag. Jimmy Walker, Brendan Todd, Harry Hall, Taylor Moore, Denny McCarthy, and Ricky Barnes, who actually showed up uh, on one of the vacation swing courses. I believe that would have been uh, Corrales. Okay, and I mentioned, uh, of course, the putter is crucial in these kind of events. Uh, always crucial, but even maybe a little bit more. And Sam Riders are up there again. This is looking at Bermuda specifically. Over the last 24 rounds, six tournaments that they played on Bermuda. Keep that in mind, right? I mean, so a lot of the Florida swing um, that we've seen. And then, uh, of course, RBC would count for that. And uh, with that said, Sam Ryder, Ben Taylor, Martin Trainer, Burns, Moore, Montgomery, Richie, my buddy, Thomas Detry, Hall, Ramey, Griffin, Cody Gribble, Fitzy, Victor Perez, which is kind of interesting. We don't see a lot of Victor. Of course, he's a place. Uh, I believe he might have just got temporary status on the PGA Tour. I saw something like that announced. Um, but he plays a ton of golf uh, in the past on the DP World Tour. And then Justin Saw, who struggled a bit at the RBC, made the cup, but then struggled on the weekend. And uh, I was trying to figure out, was there anybody here if you're putting in like the, the all putting team? So Martin Trainer and Chad Ramey, uh, what they've done very well is putting on Bermuda. So if you're looking for a cheap kind of play at the 6,200. I don't think that's a bad one there. Now, if you were looking at guys who have been best uh, with the irons and that are on the same teams, and of course, it's going to be some of the more expensive guys, but you got like Xander and Cantlay, of course, no shocker. You got Morikawa Homa. And what I did just notice was my buddy, Scott Piercy and Palmer. The problem with these guys is they are disastrous with the putter, both of them. Uh, but do pretty well on the ball striking side. But anyways, if you're interested, that is the, the best guys on approach. If you Again, if you're trying to put some teams together and want to know uh, on that front, there you go, uh, who are best with the irons. And then I took that 175 to 200 to dial in specifically with the irons. And of course, you got Taylor Pendrith, Mullinex, Shoffley, Garnett, Morikawa, Siwoo, Kim, Robbie Shelton, Ricky, Bobby Shelton, Nick Hardy, Sam Stevens, Kyle Westmore, Ryder, Robert Garrigus, Augusta Nunos uh, coming off the Latam tour. And then, of course, Corn Ferry, Doc Redmond, and Kitayama uh, have led the charge over the last 24 rounds, six tournaments from that 175 to 200. And if you're trying to pair up some guys, again, I'm just going to scan it real quick. Looks like Doc Redmond and Sam Ryder, who have done pretty well in this event. Again, we'll go look at the historical information here in a moment. And last but not least, if you want guys that are really good for that 120 to 125, uh, Garrigus, Eric Cole, which, uh, you know, partnered up with Sam Saunders. Of course, that whole tie to the API, Arnold Palmer, been friends forever. Could be kind of interesting. I just saw Sam Saunders competed at a Corn Ferry event. Ended up, I think, like top five, top six. Uh, so his game is getting back to form. He was dealing with injuries uh, in the past. Got Wyndham Clark, Brian Stewart, Morikawa, Jim Walker, who, uh, of course, did well, as we just talked about, the RBC. Got Russell Knox, no putt man, who I believe is playing with Stewart. So that's interesting. Um, that's another team that I'm kind of interested in in the lower area from a DFS perspective. Johnson, I mentioned, was Stricker, Higgs, Billy Ho, which his game I still feel like is very suspicious. Uh, but we'll see what how that all kind of fares when he gets together with Burnsy and, of course, that he's won at. And he's 
a huge fan of this event. I just, you know, he is so pro uh, team event Zurich. I'll let you in on that if you don't know. Ryan Armour, some you will know. Sam Ryder, Kyle Westmoreland, Mr. Tommy Kim, which did I see Siwoo? Nope. I thought I saw Siwoo, but he was on the previous, I believe that one. Let's go see. Let's see at the 175 to 200. So again, some really good iron players. And of course, they played together in the President's Cup and also did very well. And I don't know, Tommy Kim's game hasn't been as uh, electric as I thought it would be right now. Again, he's still learning some of these courses. Um, I feel like in a shootout fest, the guy just came in and just lit it up at like Shriners. We talked about this a lot, but um, also I, I think they could do well. Don't take me wrong. I'm just saying it's kind of interesting. Some of the courses, hence like the RBC Heritage, which I do believe he made the cut, but I don't think he did a whole lot after that. All right, let's go jump out. And I want to go uh, real quick. We're going to look at some team player history. I got also guys that have played together. I'm going to call out that I know, and then uh, we'll come back. Uh, well, actually, you know what we'll do? We'll jump over and do some of the analysis, look at weather, ownership projections. Then we'll come back, kind of wrap this thing up for you guys. Okay, so the first thing, let's look at some of the team field report that came out for the PGA. Of course, this is it here. There's a lot of different ways, of course, you can see this through DraftKings and uh, but this is what came through the PGA. It was the first thing I got to look at to see what these teams are going to look at. And all I'm going to call out first off, if you see them highlighted here, they have played together previously or quite a bit. So Bernsey, Horschel, I mentioned, this will be, I think, their third year playing together. Xander, Patrick, um, which I totally forgot we'll see this, but the player of choice that Patrick Cantlay played with for quite a couple of years in the early days of this event was uh, Patrick Reed. So you had the Patrick brothers. So I totally forgot about that, but that was a thing. But now, of course, the bromance between these two, they've been playing together for a while. And of course, your past champions last year. If you see this little check mark was for me to show you that guys that I'm interested in from a betting side and also, you know, playing from a DFS side. It doesn't mean these other guys I'm not interested in. I just was kind of calling them out. Uh, you got Ryan Brim, who just bangs it a mile off the tee. Of course, he won it, I believe it was to Puerto Rico, to uh, get his status on tour for a couple of years. And then Mark Hubbard, who just showed up at RBC. So that's an interesting pairing if you're looking at the ham and egg, where you got Brim's distance and you got Hubbard, who's, I feel like, a pretty good putter, pretty good short game. You know, Joel Damon, Danny McCarthy, uh, I actually bet these guys. And uh, the reason why is I think, you know, you got Joel Damon who does everything very well except the putting. And then you've got Danny McCarthy who's ball striking and putting. I feel like his putting, funny enough, has went down a little bit that we're used to from Danny McCarthy. But I think it's a pretty good pairing. And they've also played together before. Uh, Tyler Dunk has played this in a ton, but never played with the lefty Hammer and Hank Laboda. We got English and Tom Hoagie. Kind of interesting. Harris English, I feel is a really good putter. I'm on uh bermuda tom hoagie is a great iron player but terrible putter which you know that was probably one of my bad calls uh i didn't mention i you know i was really hoping he'd have a good show at rbc one of you guys even commented how bad his results have been at that track and i said yeah i get that but i mean his i feel like his game has kind of been in a better spot in the last uh, year or so but nope he still went out i believe him missed the cut yeah my buddy jimmy herman and ryan armor there's your kind of uh plotters at every fairway uh, not bad with the irons, you know, pretty good the short game. So that's kind of your plotter couple. You got uh, Killer Keith and Sun Jam. This is kind of an interest for me. I feel like Keith, uh, Killer Keith was really playing some really good golf. I feel like it's kind of trended down a little bit. I'd say both pretty okay putters on Bermuda Sun Jam. I feel like it's a little better, but that's kind of an interesting pairing. Uh, Austin Cook, Andrew Landry. Austin Cook, very steady, hits a lot of fairways, not bad with the irons. Andrew Landry's what got one win. I think it was at the Byron Nelson. I've forgotten now where his one win was, but uh, it's been a while since we've seen him kind of showed up. Here's your ball striker crowd. Okay, Hendrick Norlander, Luke List, uh, really good ball strikers, both terrible putters. That is one team, I'll state this, that I'm not going to touch, but uh, watch they'll end up doing something good. Smith kind of fits right into that. I mean, you literally, you can switch these two guys out. Uh, I feel like they're identical in how they play. Taylor Moore, of course, uh, had his win. And what, the Valspar? Uh, out of nowhere, kind of. Uh, Molinex, Scott Stallings, both bomber squad. We're putting a bomber squad together. There you go. I don't probably need to go through all these. We'll do some of this more when we go look. But anyways, uh, Robert Strab, Troy Merritt played this a ton together. That was really more I was trying to show you guys here. Uh, Sahith and Justice Saw, uh, I kind of interested in. Clark, Bo Hosler. And then David Lipsky and Aaron Ryan played this together quite a bit. Stewart, Russell Knox have played it quite a bit together. I mentioned Sam Ryder, Doc Redman. I believe it was last year. We'll check this out. Ended up, I think, with a third place. Kevin Tway and Kelly Craft actually early on, we'll look at this, but uh, had a good showing. And then Charlie Hoffman, 
sorry, this should have been highlighted. These guys actually made the cut every year except for last year. I believe it was the first time they missed a cut. But of course, Hoffman's game has kind of, I feel like, fallen back a bit. So that was the teams that I kind of went through. I mean, a lot of these guys have played in this, but as a, actually a team, um, a lot of these teams have kind of been mixed around. But those were the teams that have had history together. So let's look at some history. So you can do this too if you want to dive in even deeper. Uh, the best place that I found, of course, PGA Tour to go get uh, past results. And we're looking at the first year, 2017, when this event went to a team. And I mentioned Cameron Smith and Jonas Blix won this thing, shooting 27 under. So here you go. Here's a perfect example. Now, these guys, I don't even think Kisner's in this, but Scott Brown is playing in it with another plotter. I can't think of his name off the top of my head. But these guys have done really well. Now, again, this is a while ago, and maybe the competition, I don't know, wasn't as – I don't even think the competition is that strong this time. So I'll just remove that statement. Uh, there's that Kelly Craft and Tway. Uh, there's Spieth and Palmer. Uh, Kazir and Duffner, who I believe are in this, but not together. Uh, Angel Cabrera, which I think he's in jail now. Uh, J.B. Holmes, Bubba Watson, that's kind of interesting. There's that Nick Watney, Hoffman, who are paired together. Yeah, the Kepka brothers, I'm just going to scroll through this quickly. I'm, I thought this was hilarious. That Stewart and Stroud, which, you know, I've actually mistaken back in the day, uh, thinking I was playing one guy and actually clicked the other guy. Uh, but we don't have to worry about that. They're not together. I, I believe Grayson Murray's in this, but Cameron Percy... Uh, that's a kind of an odd pairing, but uh, Percy's with Chalmers, which I think is kind of an interesting pairing uh, from a DFS perspective. Uh, there's this tag Riddings, who I don't even know who that guy is, but Xander Shoffley played with him. And then here is the Patricks. Uh, you got Lingermuth, who's in this. There's Stricker with Kelly. Let's see if there's any Freddie Yakison. I haven't seen him in a while. Tyrone Asswagon, which uh, we don't have to see that guy too much uh, anymore. Uh, Hoagie Henry, Streb Merritt, there's a pairing. Ali Schneider Jans. That guy has been injured. A guy that I used to play quite a bit and uh, kind of showed up again. It was, I don't know, a couple of years ago now, but uh, it's kind of a name blast from the past. I guess he's still trying to work his way back on tour. This was a pairing that always played in this row. Stenson forever, but uh, of course, they're not in it this year because Stenson is now on the live. All right. I think that's enough for that year. Kind of move on real fast. We're going to just look at the top guys. If you're interested in how some of these pairings done, this is where you need to go is really all I'm kind of show you here. So this was the year Billy Horschel, Scott Piercy won. There's that Schroll, so Louie. So they did pair up before. Okay, Shank Duncan. There's Cantley Reed again. There's Knox with Laird. Here we go. So I did not call that out, but Percy and Chalmers played this before, and I think they're like 6,200 and uh, did pretty well. This was, again, back in 2018. There's that Scott Brown Kisner again. Funny, the South Africans uh, did okay. Let's go look at guys that missed the cut. I don't know if they, any of the guys that are relevant right now. Creo Uline. Sorry, I'm flying through this. All right, let's go to the last year. I, you guys can go take a look at this, but I, I don't want to sit here and spend a ton of time. But I just thought it was kind of interesting to go back. So, of course, last year you can't lay Shafley one. Yeah, Burns Horschel. Then there's that Ryder Redmond I mentioned. Uh, knee Smith with Moore. Is that the same pairing? It is. So I did not know that. Well, I think of Taylor Moore, I always think it's like his first year on tour. So that's kind of an interesting pairing to look at. I did not know they played this before. And ended up a T4. So that's a good side note. And that's a big thing you're going to notice here. You're going to have some crazy out of nowhere, guys. Hence, you know, what I said. I think it's a great event to... Uh, to bet on uh, some of the long shots. I think that's enough. There was Leishman and uh, Smith who won the year prior. There was Gooch with Max. Homa has not had the greatest showing. There's that, I mentioned uh, Morikawa and Victor Hovland. I think that was the power couple uh, that, you know, everybody thought would win last year and end up, you know, not doing so hot. And the year before, I mentioned he was with Wolf and did not make the cut. All right, that's enough from a history perspective. And all I was trying to show you is go here if you want to do some more analysis, but I think it's so quinky on how, you know, quinky deep how this thing works out. Okay, so I've hopped over to Fantasy National. And as always, if you're putting any money on a DFS perspective or the betting side, I highly recommend you checking this tool out. I think you could do a one month trial, especially if any of the majors coming up, uh, so you might want to look into. Okay. So what you're gonna be seeing here is always, I've got this kind of dashboard look. It's gonna show you the stroke gain information. So I'm just gonna click on this. So that way there you can see the weighting. I'm gonna be looking at T to green. I got weighted at 17, ball striking at 28, short game at 17, combining around the green and putting, then around the green and putting. So again, you can see in kind of a heavy weight in that area for my uh, model. And I've got no filters turned on. 
and this was pulling in the last six tournaments or 24 rounds of golf, which would exclude the Masters and like the WGC match play. But of course, RBC Heritage is in here. So all the data there. So you can see where they ranked out in that model. And then you can see birdies gained uh, for these guys over the last 24. Then recent results, there's no tournament history that has pulled in for this event in Fantasy National. So if I click on that, we're not going to see uh, anything. Well, I take that back unless it's in the individual event, but I'm not really concerned about that. It's a whole different ball game. So what I'm going to do is I've got 12 teams that I'm kind of interested in that uh, I'll be probably playing a little more than the others. And then uh, just let you kind of look at the results. It gets a little difficult when we get down here because some of these teams are priced the same. And I don't know every team that is combined, but I know quite a few that I've been looking at. Of course, the number one team, Patrick Cantley and Xander, and I think it's pretty much their, theirs to win, right? I think everybody kind of feels that way. The betting market shows, I believe, like four to one on the odds. But if they don't win, then I feel like it kind of opens it up, especially from a betting side, that I kind of feel like then any team can win if these guys do not perform well. But if these guys perform well, it's kind of game over, and I see them going back to back. So that'd be, you know, if I'm going to pay that kind of price tag, I will be, uh, you know, I, I would put this team in. Morikawa Homa, I've already mentioned Morikawa typically does, has not shown well in this format with other Hovland, who's a great ball striker, and of course, Wolf at the time. Max Homa's been playing great golf, but I also feel like Max is kind of showing me at least, you know, if it's not California, I don't think Max can do the putting as well. Uh, still really prefers the POA. So I will kind of probably pass on that group. Killer Keith, Sun Jam, I mean, been playing really good golf. I don't have a problem with playing these guys. I think you see the putter would be the one issue, at least over the last six tournaments that they played on. And a lot of that has been Bermuda. So maybe a little off on that. I think Thigala is, so is kind of interesting a lot of because of how well Thigala has been playing and his putter. And Suz, you know, did not putt well at all at the RBC. Uh, let's go look at that real quick because I just want to make sure I'm, I'm what I saw. It felt like he was okay. I take that back. He actually putted okay, but when I was watching him because I had him in a showdown team, he was missing a lot of putts. But he actually gained. It was a, everything else was a disaster around the green approach. So do with that you may. I mean that's not typical. I feel like for Justin Saw, see over his last uh, ten events, he's actually gained. You know, with the ball striking and the putter has been pretty solid. So maybe he just had an off week there. Uh, but that's an interesting pairing. 10,000, I don't know, I think it's a little steep for those two. But again, it kind of falls off the face of the earth that you get like after the top five, six teams. Uh, I'm actually interested in Tom Kim and Siwoo, just the chemistry, what they did in the President's Cup. I feel like Tom Kim's game has not been exactly where he liked the putter. But if that putter gets hot again, uh, he is an aggressive putter. Uh, watch out, we know Siwoo went back to a short putter which I don't know if that's helped or hurt him. You can see his results have not been the greatest, but both amazing ball strikers, if they can get a putter going, watch out. So I'm kind of interested in that team. You know, Billy Ho, Sammy Burns, I feel like Billy Ho could be the, the person that holds this team back. That's what I kind of felt like even last year, but Billy Horschel loves this event. He's won on this course, uh, which shows back here way back in 2013. And I told you how serious he takes this. So I might sprinkle in some Burns and Billy, uh, I like both those guys. Just Billy's game's been a little rough this year. I think this pairing of Bo Hosler and Wyndham Clark is interesting. I'll play them a little bit, um, but they're not one of my like favorite teams to plug in quite a bit. And I'm uh, just curious on tournament history, if those guys have done anything here. I'm going to skip on J.J. Spawn and Hayden Buckley. Um, it's not really my cup of tea. You can see not making a lot of birdies. And I think this, you, I think you do need to, because of the length, and I think it's going to be a little wet. We're going to look at the weather here in a bit. Um, yeah, they're just not the combination I'm looking for. Actually, as I mentioned, very interested in Kitayama and Taylor Montgomery. So that'd probably be the team I'm kind of waiting a little more. Can you, you can see Kitayama wins the Arnold Palmer and then, hit, you know, had, did make a cup before or after. And uh, of course, neither of these guys have played this track before, but I like that pairing. It was the one that caught my eye. Uh, Lipsky, Aaron Rye, uh, both really good ball strikers, but both very bad with the putter. So I'm going to kind of stick away from there. Uh, Joel Damon and Denny McCarthy. Joel Damon typically on Bermuda. If, let me go take a look. Again, I always when I say something, I want to qualify it. It's his best, worst surface. So um, Joel Damon is not known as a very good putter, but, you know, hits a lot of greens, pretty good tee to green. 
But, you know, Dave McCarthy makes up for that, and I feel like his ball striking has gotten there. So for that price tag, I think it's a, a little bit of value. I mean, I would definitely like this pairing better than the Rye, Lipsky, and you're saving, what, 100 bucks. So there you go. Uh, English Hoagie, you know, like I said, they're kind of a good ham and egg. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. Not not really doing it for me. I actually think that Neesmith and Taylor Moore – uh, is interesting for me and just how well Taylor Morris been playing that they played together. They should have good chemistry. So that's a team I'm going to plug in. Uh, I'm going to skip probably Harden or Davis Riley. They, he, again, they have the length. I mean, they kind of have a similar game, but I just feel like both of them around the green and putting is so bad. I'd rather go to Hadwin and Nick Taylor. Of course, we know that Nick Taylor uh, has been playing really good golf and they had a chance to win the waste management. I think that's a little bit of a value for those guys that I'm also – I didn't bet those guys, but I'm going to take a look at the the odds. I don't know what it is off the top of my head. If it's, I don't know, 30 or better, 30 to 1 or better, I might do that. I feel like, funny enough, Kazire and Todd have kind of a similar game. I feel like around the green and putting is where they would shine. Uh, but off the tee, you know, Kazire goes a little wayward. Todd's very accurate, but doesn't get much length. You know, Doc Redman and Sam Ryder, I, I will play these guys. You know, I'll highlight them because they will be played. Um just Doc Redman has been in a, in a really bad form, except for the Valspar. So, but they have played together before and shown up here, I believe, multiple times. Um, so, something works there. Of course, uh, Alex uh, is kicking around the Corn Ferry. Went pro in 2022 out of Wake Forest. Don't have a ton on him. You know, he, he played one tournament, missed a cut at the Valspar. Uh, but Fitzy, of course, just coming off the win and feels like everything is a go with him. But I don't know. That's one from a differentiation. I don't think a lot of people will play these guys, but maybe that you know Matt because of the win will get a little more ownership. Got Ricky, Bobby, and Hodges. No, that doesn't really do it for me. Justin Hadley and Bramlett. There's kind of you know he's got the distance. Hadley, he's got the putter, but again, it's not a scramble. I'm actually more interested in Wu and Ben Martin. Uh, Wu is just amazing ball striker. The putter, you know, can be his nemesis. Ben Martin's just been playing great golf, tee to green and putting. So. You know, both good ball strikers should get opportunities if Brandon can make some putts uh, for the for both sides for, you know, of course, alternate or even best ball. I mean, again, the ultimate goal is that your team has the most opportunities to make birdies together. So even in best ball, right, I mean, you're taking the best score, but it'd be nice if they both have birdie putts each time and then alternate. Right. It's just kind of managing that day and, you know, at least maybe shooting a couple under if possible. That's the one where guys struggle. Of course, they're playing. They got to pick one ball to play. So, you know, I don't know which balls these guys play. I mean, the people will get into that of, yes, they both play Pro V's or they both play Cirque or whatever. Um, I don't get that worried about it. They'll figure that out. I mean, I'm sure they'll both be careful. I think the, the European guys here are going to be kind of the sexy picks. So, Horgard and Olsen are playing together. And they got Victor Perez and Detri. As you see right now, I've not really landed on either team. Um, I just think, I don't know, I think ownership is going to be weighed on them because of just, again, just something sexy to pick. And I'm not super uh, excited. I mean, Horgard is probably the one that I think has played the best golf that we've seen out of the guys. You know who I think is kind of interesting uh, is this, you know, the Ryder Cup captain, U.S. Ryder Cup captain Johnson and Stricker. They both have such similar games. And uh, Zach Johnson has been playing pretty well. Steve Stricker kind of plots around. Of course, uh, typically, if you get him on the John Deere, he's won there a ton. Uh, he did show up at the Honda, funny enough. Let me see. You see, I had a six. I, I knew these guys probably have some history back at a single event. But I don't know. I mean, just from a, guys that play very similar golf, that could be an interesting sneaky pair, at least to get you a made cut and get you maybe in a top 15. Uh, something I'm thinking about. Uh, woo. And Lauer are playing together. Nah, I like Dylan Wu. I, Justin Lauer makes me a bit nervous. Ryan Palmer, Scott Piercy, they both can't putt, so I just can't do it. Both good ball strikers. We have seen Scott Piercy get hot with a putter. Uh, Ryan Palmer does like this event. He had a T4 here, but, I mean, that's so long ago. Yeah, I'm going to say no. I'd rather go to Ryan Gerard and Ben Griffin. I, I like Ben Griffin. Of course, Ryan Gerard popped on the scene at the Honda He's made four out of five cuts at a good Puerto Rico. You know, I just, I don't know. I'm kind of interested in, in a lot of this probably for Ben Griffin's side. 
And then I'm going to start to follow you know, a lot of these guys, like Akshay and what Harry Hall are playing together. I don't know, kind of interesting. I think Davis Thompson and Will Gordon are together. Um, and this is where I'm going to kind of just scroll through. You know, all these guys, I mean, you got, uh, you know, I mentioned the the um, ball striking crew, Camp Putt, with uh, Luke List and Henrik Norlander. I have Neesmith. I already get to those guys. I think I already picked on those. Um it's Stallings, and who's he with? He's with someone that bombs the ball, and now I'm forgetting. Oh, Mullinex and Stallings. It was a good bomber crew. I'm trying to think. I did make one more pick. This was kind of interesting. I believe it's what, Hubbard and Pendrith are playing together? Nope, I take that back. It's the Canadians are playing together. Oh, it's Brim and Hubbard. I don't know. It's kind of interesting. Hubbard's actually played here twice. Not not a great showing. I don't know. And then, of course, you got the Canadians playing together. But funny enough, what I noticed is the Canadian teams playing together, and I've already picked one, right? Nick Taylor and Hadwin have not fared that well in this event. I mean, again, total just quinky deep, but I just noticed that the Canadian parents uh, have not worked out. And then we're going to talk about uh, Molinari and Luke Donald because I looked at ownership projections. Believe it or not, this team uh, right now is the highest owned. And Molinari... So how I look at this, of course, Luke Donald is the Ryder Cup captain for Europe. It's in Italy. Uh, I think they're looking at Francesco and, a, and maybe a, a Eduardo to the brothers to play together. So maybe that's why they're playing together. Molinari's actually had some nice showings on the DP Walter. When I say that, like, you know, a couple top 20s, top 40, uh, has been playing pretty decent golf. So I just thought it was really weird right now that they're the highest owned team uh, within Fantasy National. I think the Sam Saunders and Eric Cole, I know they're, you know, grew up good friends. Got the Arnold Palmer, you know, connection. Of course, Sam is his grandson. Probably heard a ton of it to nauseam at the API, the Arnold Palmer. So not going to go any depth there. Uh, I think I mentioned, what do you got? Tway. So I think it's what Merritt and Streb are together. No, thank you. But Tway and Kraft, I think, I don't even know why he's not showing up anywhere. Oh, there he is. I'm not saying any, that's a great team, but they've just played a ton together. It could be someone down here. All right, I'm going to scroll down because the only other team that I'm interested in uh, is, I believe, somewhere way down here. There we go. So if you're looking for a cheapie, uh, my cheapie play is going to be this Greg Chalmers and Cameron Percy. You see Cameron Percy, I think I've talked about this guy a ton. Um, he for the price tag, he I think he's one of the better values within DFS whenever you can play him. Guy makes a ton of cuts. He showed up at the Hana, the Valspar. Of course, I believe they're both Australian. Um, I don't know that much about Greg Chalmers, I'll be honest. But you see, he's been making cuts. I think they also kind of got the same kind of game, kind of plot their way around. Yeah, I'm kind of interested in that from a cheap, cheap play, and I think it should be you know pretty low owned. All right, with that said, um, that's really all, and I, I'll summarize it real quick. And like I said, probably the reason why I want this tournament to go away is because from a analyst perspective, it is really difficult for multiple reasons, as you see, like even trying to figure out who's paired with who. And it's just, it's like I said, it's kind of like you're throwing darts uh, at a dartboard and, and hoping because stroking kind of goes out. You can't, you know, can't look how they've done on the course historically, like Everything, you're kind of just like, well, I'm just going to go with this lane. So, of course, Cantlay, Xander um, would be your number one you know, team that, again, if they don't win it, I feel like, who watch out? Uh, it could be a, kind of a shocking win. You got the Kim brothers, uh, like Kitty Yama Montgomery. You got Damon McCarthy, Neesmith Moore. You got the Canadians I'm kind of interested in. You got the team that's playing this quite a bit, uh, who's shown pretty well even last year with Redmond and Ryder. Uh, we got Wu and Benny Martin, uh, pretty interested in. You got the uh, the U.S. Uh, Ryder Cup captains playing together. You got the the rookies, Griffin and Gerard, the G the G men. Uh, if you need the bomber and the putter, you know, we got Brim and Hubbard. This one just kind of came out of nowhere. S.H. Kim and Ben Wyan, I'm kind of interested in. You've got the Arnold Palmer connection, uh, good friends, Sam Saunders, Eric Cole caddied for each other. Like I said, you guys heard enough. I don't think I need to go in. And then you got, I believe we're going to call them the Australian pairing. Uh, I don't know enough about Greg Chalmers. I know a little bit about Cameron Percy for the really cheap play. So that's kind of the teams that I'm looking from a core group to play in DFS. I'm probably gonna do a little more betting than I will from a DFS. I actually don't know how much I'll have invested in this, Uh, but you know, Hey, it's an event. 
it's uh, it's different. I just, you know, how dare you let the Dell match play go and keep this thing. So I don't know if this is around next year. I've not heard, but uh, if this thing's on the, the calendar next year and the Dell match play, uh, it's, it's pretty sad. All right, let's uh, real quick, we'll go through ownership projections while I'm here. I did refresh this right now. I mean, you can see how much excitement there is about this event. That's probably the lowest number I've seen since, I don't know, some early, like, you know, uh, fall swings uh, events. But uh, I mentioned Eduardo Molinari, funny enough, right now is right up there with Xander and Patrick. Uh, you got the Kim brothers right there. You got Killer Keith. And uh, now I'm blanking for whatever reason who he's with. Sahith, you got the Burns and a Horschel. There's my uh, Denny McCarthy play that I like. There's Victor Perez. I told you the Euros would probably be interesting. The Griffin team that I was interested in. Gerard, you got Morikawa all the way down here with Homa. That's all, you know, I think a lot, the little bit that's been put in, I think people are kind of feeling the same way. Uh, I like the Brandon Wu play we mentioned. My Cameron Percy is all the way up to 11%. So some other people kind of like that team, at least, again, it's such a low... I do not like this team. I'm not picking them. Um, Steve Stricker with Zach Johnson. Kind of shocked that the uh, the Horgard Olison is not more owned. So, I mean, if you want to get a little uh, interest or a little different, I guess. And that's about it. I mean, like I said, I think just to give you guys a little bit, I don't, I don't know how much ownership is going to fall on anybody, but like the top four or five teams are going to be heavily owned and then, I think everybody's just going to spray and pray from there, to be honest. This is where you're going to want to pull it from Windfinder. This Bayou Gouch, Gouch um, is the area that I'm pulling from. I'll I'll show you what the PGA released from uh, the weather. I think it's a little better information. Okay, so let's kind of talk real quickly about weather. The only reason why this is, I think, even uh, important is if you are thinking about building teams, maybe the distance off the tee thing was I was talking about wouldn't it be bad, right? So you got... Uh, we got some expected winds uh, coming Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So, again, you know, if there's some Texas, I don't really think there. I know Palmer. I don't know Piercy, to be honest. I don't know if Piercy is from Texas or not. But, you know, if you start thinking about maybe the Australians or, you know, here you go, the European angle, because they're going to have some weather they're going to be dealing with. Uh, gust up to 22 on Thursday, 20, 25 to 30. You've got some rain. So then you can also think of the guys – uh, that might need some distance. I feel like these fairways could be a little slow. I feel like I have heard there's been a, a bit of rain already in that region. So keep an eye on the weather. It is This was, as you can see, issued Tuesday morning, so a lot could change. But they're going to have some wins. So think about that. Maybe you want to play more European team, or maybe I might build one that is a European specific, just, you know, if this, some weather kicks up. Okay, real quick, my betting card. And like I said, there might be some addition to this. What you're going to notice, literally, I told you I came out and I bet the Montgomery Kitty Yama right off the bat at 22 to 1. And then I went Long Shot City because I told you, I believe if Xander and Cantley don't walk away with this thing, that it could open up uh, where Long Shots could definitely win this thing. And so the Hubbard team with Brim, I think Tway with Kraft. There was a couple of rookies. I can't remember who Westmoreland was playing with. Langermuth was playing good golf. And he's, I think, with Jonas Blix. He had a couple of good showings, I believe, on the vacation swing. You got Stewart and then Scotty Brown, who played a lot on here with Kisner, but is not with Kisner this time, and I can't remember who he's with. But literally all I'm saying is if you see a few teams with the high odds, want to put a few bucks on them, this could be uh, one of the events that we could get a long shot. Again, uh, just because of the format. All right, and that's it. There's my buddy uh, Damon smoking one off the tee at the Zurich. Thanks for spending some time with me. Like I said, from a perspective of doing one of these shows, it's a lot harder um, because we don't have the you know past stroke gain data. It's not really based on stroke gain data. It's trying to figure out which teams will play together, chemistry. You know, which way are you going? Are you going guys that are you know uh, trying to pick? And I think the best way where I'm going to fall is I'm going to pick guys with like skill sets. I'm going to pick maybe some European guys. I'm going to pick some guys that have played this quite a bit and go from there. But I really feel like almost harder than actually the Dell match play to kind of figure this out. That's my own opinion. All right. Do me the honor. Click that like button. Share it with anybody else. If you're not subscribed and you like how I do what I do, hit that subscribe button. And as always, follow me on Twitter. I do keep an eye on everything and update. And also during the tournament, you know, tweet out some funny things or whatever I see. And with that said, guys, enjoy the Zurich. Again, I, I know it's probably not all of our favorite at least not mine, but it is a different format. I just hope that they keep the, the match play, and if they're going to get rid of anything, you can get rid of this team event. They do a QB shootout, which I didn't get in all that. I mean, there's different teams that do it, but if you want to, go check out the QB shootout. Maybe there's some teams that have done, but I just feel like 
it's, if you've ever played like in a scramble or a team format is very quinky on, on who does well, you know, and, and who doesn't, that's just my own personal opinion. All right, guys, talk to you later. Have a great turn. Uh, enjoy the weekend and enjoy the tournament. And I'll talk to you. I believe we got the Mexico open next and I'll uh, try to put something out for that. <laughs>